thank you all for joining us today for Women in Leadership, a coming together celebration. We have a very exciting program for you today that's going to be showcasing some incredibly impressive Canadian women leaders. Some are artists, some are youth, but either way, I have a funny feeling you're really going to enjoy this. And for those of you who are wondering who I am, my name is Juliet Powell, and I have the pleasure of guiding you through today's incredibly inspiring event. We're joined for the first ever gathering of its kind by the women mayors and First Nations leaders from every single region of Canada. I think it might just be the first time ever. And regardez cet impressionnant groupe de femmes qu'on a avec nous aujourd'hui. Watch this impressive group of women. Our leaders have identified as change makers in their communities. Now pay attention because these are the leaders of tomorrow. We're also welcoming today our neighbor from the south of the border. That's right, the U.S. State Department's Gender Equality Advisor. So joignant également nous des centaines de Canadiennes qui regardent cet événement. We have hundreds of Canadians watching in English and French, thanks to the live uh, broadcasting. Thank you for being part of this great celebration with us speakers. I'm going to run through some important technical details just to make sure that you don't have any issues moving forward. For those that are watching us via the live stream broadcast, you join the event in either English or French, so hopefully the language of your choice. Mais pour changer de langue et pour demander de l'aide. Now to switch or ask for technical support, it's very easy. Just go back on the homepage and on the broadcasting platform and select the language of your uh, that are joining us in our Zoom TV studio. Your access to simulta uh, translation, simultaneous translation is going to be a little bit different, but just as easy. Please find the globe icon that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen and just toggle it. And that way you get to listen to the event in either French or English. Remember, if you have any issues whatsoever, all you have to do is post a note in the chat and we'll reach out to you directly. Again, today we are celebrating women in leadership in Canada, but it's a very important time. We've all been through so much this year, a time when COVID-19 has literally restructured our lives and impacted women in all of our diversity disproportionately. Today, we have women who led their community and were very resilient all along the period. To get our program underway by introducing you to Elder Claudette Commanda. She'll be delivering our opening ceremony prayer. And Claudette Algonquin Anushnabi from Kitigan Zibi Anushinabeg. First Nation located in Quebec, and Claudette has dedicated the last 35 years promoting First Nations people, history, culture, and rights. She's a professor for the University of Ottawa's Institute of Women's Studies. She's part of the Faculty of Education and the Faculty of Law and the Aboriginal Studies Program. Au fait, elle occupe un poste de directrice générale de la Confédération des Centres. She is a director general of the Educational and Cultural Centre in the First Nation and organized, National Organization, whose mandate is to protect, promote the uh, First Nation culture, language, and traditional knowledges. Nikki Fraser will deliver her acknowledgement today. For those of you who don't know Nikki, she is an indigenous Indigenous advocate from Kamloops, BC, Canada. She started Uniting Our Voices, a platform working for and towards inclusion and equality by creating a space for more Indigenous voices to be heard, to build connections, and to inspire more change makers through stories and engagements. She's involved in Indigenous research and advocacy through a gender sensitive lens, which is so important. She's part of research and uh, native uh, advocacy to be uh, gender sensitive, and this is so important. She's part of the young leaders of the UN for the sustainable development objectives and envoy in youth. That's from the UN. She uh, studied at Thompson River University, part of a list of uh, 2019. Uh, 
50 uh, more uh, women of uh, women, uh, the wear magazine avec elder commander welcome Kwe Sheba. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. I am so honored to be here with you beautiful women, beautiful, strong sisters. What a, such a beautiful day today. It is raining here where I am. However, the sun is shining because I am surrounded by the beauty, the intelligence, the wisdom, and the strength of all you women leaders. It blesses my heart to give these words of welcome as well as to bring a blessing. And we start this meeting in a good way. So, chimi wedge, kwe kakena kwe. Pijajiko ma nishna be eki o mama wenene wag. Bonjour à tous. Bienvenue au territoire des mes ancêtres. Welcome to you too. Welcome to the uh, my ancestors' land. I got one uh, land. I'm very uh proud of welcoming you and also to give you my blessings one of you beautiful people to this unsurrendered homeland of the algonquin people the homeland that my sis my ancestors have held since time immemorial the homeland where my relatives were born and raised the homeland where our descendants will come to and the homelands that we must always ensure will be here in order for our descendants and our children of today and our grandchildren of today, that they will have the right of their ways of knowing and their ways of being. I acknowledge the homelands of all indigenous peoples from coast to coast to coast. I acknowledge you. I acknowledge the first ancestors of this land. Nijen Wendaganag, Omama Wenaniwag. I acknowledge my ancestors my ancestors who continue to uphold me, my ancestors who continue to guide me, and my ancestors who continue to love me each and every day and love all our people. I acknowledge each and every one of you, your ancestors. It is said through the teachings of our people that we must always remember where we come from. We must always acknowledge our ancestors. They were here, they provided that path for us and they continue to walk with us each and every moment of our lives. So, I will say this blessing to, for this gathering. And I ask that you say your words in the way that you are comfortable, in the way that you believe, in the way that you've been instructed. And since that we are here together, together as women, as sisters, let us acknowledge that first mother. Let us acknowledge that first grandmother. We put our minds, our hearts, and our voice together and we say, We say thank you to Mother Earth. We put our minds and our hearts and our voice together to acknowledge that first grandmother. We thank our grandmother, the moon. We also acknowledge that first grandfather, our grandfather, the son, as we, as we say, Chimi Gwedjmishomiskizis, as he makes his way across the earth and prepares for the rise of our grandmother, the moon, we acknowledge. We say, Chimi Gwedj Kokamisag, Chimi Gwedjmishomsag, Da Spinigan Oma Nongum, Nibuksendam Mashkawizewin, Nibuksendam Zagiediwin. And Creator, we thank you. We thank you for all. We thank you for everything. We thank the grandmothers and the grandfathers of the four directions to be in this circle. And we ask them for their guidance. We ask them to bless us with strength. We ask them to bless us with that good life. We ask them to bless us with the love and kindness that we have for one another and to express it. And we say, Chimi Gwedge, Creator, for you in our prayer. And Creator, we walk together as brothers and sisters on this land called Mother Earth. And Creator, my prayer for all who are gathered here, that we continue to walk with the seven grandfathers. And we acknowledge those seven grandfathers, the grandfather of love, 
wisdom, respect, courage, humility, honesty, and truth. And creator, my prayer for all the women leaders who are here is that they, we celebrate their leadership for the aim for their goals, celebrating their strength and know that their voice is power for indeed the truth is the power of our women leaders. And we thank you creator for blessing us. And together we lift our minds, our hearts, our spirit, and we say thank you to creator. Miigwech, miigwech, thank you. I, I want to um, congratulate all the women leaders who are here. And I thank you for your leadership. I thank those young le women leaders. Thank you for your vision and your strength and walking in the, with the guidance of your ancestors. And I want to, to thank, and I want to congratulate Roseanne Archibald for being newly elected as our national chief. So Chimi Gwej, and I'm so honored, so honored, Roseanne Archibald, I am so honored to call you my sister and my relative, and I wish you all the best, and I raise my hands up to you. Chi miigwech, izagi, and thank you everyone, miigwech. Today, I want to acknowledge you as well. Thank you for being here and sharing space and occupying space with um, inspiring women. And um, I want to acknowledge uh, Chief Roseanne. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet her. She was here in my home territory of Sukwekmik Uluk and my daughter uh, Ayana had the opportunity to meet her as well too. So Kukstachem, I want to acknowledge you, uh, Chief Roseanne. So, um, I also want to acknowledge the traditional territory that I come from today, which is again, Sukhlet Uluk. It's the homelands of my people. Um, the caretakers of Sukhlet Uluk is the interior of BC. And I wanna acknowledge all um, the territories that you guys are joining us from today. It's really exciting to hear that we have uh, some people joining us from down south across the borders. I think that's really beautiful. And to Indigenous people, that border never existed. And so our, our traditional homelands do cross over and uh, there was no borders there before. So I wanna acknowledge um, th those territories across the, the border as well. Um, I just wanna give a, a little uh, history about land acknowledgements that it's much more than just acknowledging the land. You're, a land acknowledgement is acknowledging the original caretakers of those lands. And uh, when you do that, you're acknowledging the history that those lands um, hold. In my teachings, the land is where our language comes from. The land is where our teachings and culture and traditions come from. And so when you do a land acknowledgement, you're just not acknowledging the physical aspect of it. You're acknowledging the the teachings, the language that associated with those caretakers and those peoples of that land. So um, I'm acknowledging all those languages, all those teachings, all those traditions where you guys are joining us from today. And I wanna say uh, for having me be a part of the opening. And I'm really excited to um, listen to some of the keynote speakers. So Kukstachem, thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki, and thank you, Elder Commander. Merci à vous deux. 
Now, we know that there are many members and friends of the Equal Futures Network that are joining us today. And for some of you, this might even be the first time that you've actually connected with the network and the organization that coordinates it, which is the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health. I was lucky. I was a moderator for some events this year. And now I have with me Julia Anderson. She's the CEO of the organization. Network. And maybe some of the background on Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health, because in English and French, the acronyms are different and they might not even make the association. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Juliet. And let me just acknowledge. Uh, Elder Claudette, thank you so much for opening our meeting in such a good way, and Nikki for your land acknowledgments and for your teachings that you offered us. Um, and let me acknowledge the first people of the land on which I stand, which is the Mississauga Anishinaabe people known on settler maps as Peterborough. I've had the great honor to work with many elders in this community through the university um, that hosts uh, an Indigenous Studies program. And I hope that my words today uh, do honor to the teachings that I've been offered. So the Equal Futures Network uh, coordinated by Ken Watch is a really exciting uh, coming together, just like this event is, of over 350 organizations and growing stronger. Please sign your organizations, your communities up to be part of the Equal Futures Network from coast to coast to coast, all different types from big city institutional organizations to small grassroots community organizations, um, groups in rural areas, remote areas, from LGBTQI issues to menstruation, we are covering a whole scope of everything it means to advance gender equality across this land. Each and every one of the entities that is part of the Equal Futures Network has something to offer and something to learn. And that is the spirit by which we have created the Equals Futures Network. We all have something to give and something to receive and we must build together greater momentum for our collective work. So we thought, uh, what are the assets? What are the things that we as an organization, as the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health can bring to the table as an offering? And one of the things that we have is a map. And it's a, a highly technical back end map on which we have projects and programs all across the globe uh, looking to advance the health and rights of women, children, and adolescents. So we thought, could we map out and put on the map all of your work, all of the Canadian organizations doing work on this land to advance gender equality? So the first idea was, let's put it on the map. The second idea was, let's bring people together. Let's bring people together in large events, in small incubator events, day to day. Let's build relationship among, across, and within this amazing Equal Futures Network. I would like to thank, uh, I mean, there's there's so many folks to, to thank, but I would like to thank uh, Women and Gender Equality Canada, the department, um, and Minister Monitsev personally for recognizing that data matters, that putting our voices together and on a map matters, and that seeing the collective is bigger than seeing the individual parts. And we're just so grateful for your support and for your belief in that idea of the importance of us coming together. So I invite you uh, humbly to join the Equal Futures Network if you're not already a member, get your information out there, put it on, on a map. If you are a small entity that's not formalized, you deserve a place on the map. If you're a large institution that has programming across uh, this nation or across uh, you know, even to the southern borders, put your work on the map, spend time with us so that we can connect you to others. I would also just before I pass, uh, introduce Minister Monsef, I would like to just thank uh, Juliet. Uh, she said she had had the honor of uh, moderating and truly it has been our greatest pleasure, Juliet, to have you as a moderator and a convener. I learn a lot from just watching you uh, moderate and engage with people and just thank you for being here and thank you for your own personal work outside of this um, to advance equality and diversity here in Canada and around the world. Aww. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our co-host, the Honourable Mariam Monsef, the Minister for Women and Gender Equality and for Rural Economic Development and a Member of Parliament for Peterborough Kawartha. 
She was recognized by Apolitical as one of the top 20 most influential people in gender policy for two consecutive years. Minister Monseft has helped to shape the conversation about gender equality on the national and indeed on a global stage. We are so incredibly proud to have her represent gender equality for Canada and to be the voice that she is bringing a diversity of perspectives to the table. Minister Monsef is committed to bringing, also committed to bringing the voice of rural Canada to the cabinet table, where she's working on important rural economic development priorities, including expanding access to broadband. And if, if the pandemic has taught us something, it is the importance of us all having a great internet connection. That's something that my team, being a virtual organization for five years with lots of rural staff, has learned a lot about over the past years. She's an alum of Trent University, speaks English, Farsi, and Dari. Minister Monsef, welcome. The stage is yours. Thank you so much for your support and for being with us uh, today. Thank you so much, Julia Anderson, brilliant Juliet. Uh, bonjour, Anine. Salam alaikum. Hello. I join you from my home in Peterborough, Kawartha, on Treaty 20 territory on a rainy but beautiful day. I am so grateful to Elder Kimanda and to you, Nikki, for joining us. Elder Kimanda, I miss you. I miss the hugs. I miss the chats on the sides of the conversations that, that would start with you sharing your wisdom in a good way. And I look forward to the day when we can come back together under the same roof. But until then, these connections will have to do. I'll, I'll focus my remarks on why we're here today, make an announcement about our $100 million Feminist Response and Recovery Fund, which you all have helped shape. And, you know, let me though do what smart elders and teachers have taught me, uh, which is begin with gratitude. I'm grateful to those who've come before us so that women like me could have the right as well as the audacity to put our name on the ballot. I'm grateful to our teams who have held us up and kept things moving forward in the most difficult circumstances over the past 500 plus days. I am grateful that Roseanne Archibald is here representing the AFN and continuing to shatter glass ceilings and inspiring generations of leaders as she does so. I'm grateful for the sisterhood that is always been needed for the feminist movement to move forward. I'm grateful that that movement has created the conditions that have led to more women being elected and at the table at this moment than ever before because representation matters. I have seen it in the past six years as an elected official. If we have a childcare framework and a policy that has a distinction focus for indigenous families, separate focus for kids with disabilities and exceptionalities, if we're looking after working moms and making sure they pay half of what they've been paying for childcare, it's because we've had the representation of those women, those voices, those experiences at the table. If we've got the lexicon to talk about feminist response and recovery, it's because 25 years ago in Beijing, Canadian women and Canadians pushed to have the gender-based analysis plus tool recognized and then they brought it to Canada and have been building on it through the work of the public service ever since. If Canada's response to COVID has been recognized internationally as having the best gendered re sensitive response, it's because we have the representation in the back rooms as elected officials and within our brilliant public service. I am so grateful for that because as that representation increases in diversity, the burden and the responsibility on those who aren't the usual types of reps around the table is lessened so that they can focus on their mission and the outcomes they want to push for. I am grateful that Madam Premier 
is here. Caroline Cochran is here as the only woman premier in the country. And Madam Premier, I get goosebumps thinking about you, watching you on TV, because I remember being in your neck of the woods not too long ago and listening to you talk about the importance of representation in the back rooms and on the ballot and to watch you live out your dream and to push those boundaries and then to rock it as you have with the COVID response. That brings me to why we're here today. We're here today because it has been a tough year to be a leader and we're going to continue to need each other to be at the table, to stay at these tables, even though these institutions in which we work were not designed for us. They were not designed to welcome us. In fact, they were designed deliberately to push us out and that history has not changed. So every single day with the deaths by a thousand cuts, the, the microaggressions and the not so microaggressions, I'm sure all of us have experienced days where we're reminded what our place is and we're pushed out and we have a hard time talking about it. But from time to time, we talk about a business that chews us up and spits us out. But I'm grateful to the young leaders here and all of you who showed up here today because we also need to talk about why we do this work, why we stick it out, why we push forward, how we're able to overcome those hardships because these are incredible jobs too. They allow us to make a world of difference for people who have been there for us and to have some pretty cool experiences. We're going to hear from Roseanne Archibald today and we get to be in a virtual room with her. That is a pretty sweet gig uh, if you ask me. We get to be at the table as Canada enters the post-pandemic world and we get to shape decisions that are going to make a world of difference for generations to come. There are many reasons to put your name on a ballot, to sign up to be part of any political organization and to make a difference for your community. And that's why we're here today, to talk about the gaps, to talk about how it hurts, to talk about how we overcome, but to also talk about why we do it and why we have to keep pushing forward. Our American colleagues are here as well. Leora Falk is here from the White House Gender Equality Council. And may I just say uh, thank you so much to our uh, colleagues at the, at the White House. It's nice to have feminists at the White House to connect with, to work with, and we look forward to addressing the gaps and heeding the lessons of COVID together with you. The YWCA and its partners during COVID gave us a pretty strong roadmap of a feminist response and recovery. And we took what they said, what the uh, committees in the House of Commons said, what thousands of Canadians, women, gender diverse folks, BIPOC plus folks told us during the pandemic to design a hundred million dollar fund specifically focused on a feminist response and recovery. These projects were designed to address systemic barriers that are faced by underrepresented women across the country, including Indigenous women, Black women, racialized women, members of LGBTQ2 plus communities, those in rural and remote communities, youth, elders, those hardest hit by COVID. Today, I'm delighted to announce that as part of this work, 237 projects have been selected, helping women's and equity seeking organizations across the country respond to the diverse needs and the opportunities that have emerged post COVID. This funding includes $35 million directly to support projects that promote the representation of diverse women in positions of leadership. This investment is the most significant uh, to date by the government of Canada uh, or any government in Canada in support of women's leadership. And if we're here, it's because of thoughtful feminist organizations who have inspired us, who have pushed us, who have taught us and brought the rest of Canada along and to all of you who have worked so incredibly hard during the pandemic 
You've helped save the lives of more than a million women and children in their hour of need who've been fleeing violence and abuse. You've done it from your kitchen tables while caring for your loved ones. And you've maintained your compassion, professionalism, and your creativity in the government of Canada. The Prime Minister of Canada will continue to rely on your expertise to ensure that we don't lose the hard-won gains of women because of this pandemic. CanWatch, Julia, the team that is amongst the most creative, we appreciate your expertise and your partnership and your ability to convene feminists. When I got this job in January 2017, it was just 10 days before Mr. Trump was sworn in as the president of the United States of America. And there was a lot happening here in Canada too. My vision, inspired by the Prime Minister's mandate, was to ensure the sustainability of the feminist movement and to build coalitions who get shit done across the country. We have been able to build that foundation, but our work is far from over. So when I see badass women like Chief Emily Wheatung on this screen, when I see Minister Leela Ahir on this screen, when I see her worship Nancy Peckford, the, the architect of Daughters of the Vote here, along with all of you, I get goosebumps and I get excited about the difficult but important work ahead. So merci beaucoup. Tisha Kaur, Chimi Gwech for making time for this today. We've never done this before. So we'll see how it goes. And hopefully with, with your cooperation and the ongoing inspiring work from CanWatch, we'll get to do this again and again and again. So merci, Juliette, my friend. Thank you. Back to you. Mais merci, Minister Monsef. Thank my, you very much. My heart beating, my, my, ear, my eyes are just tearing up because I realized that if this, had, this fund had existed when I was younger, I probably never would have left Canada. The money that you're investing in women leaders, uh, the money that you're investing in diversity, this is what I personally, as a Canadian, have been waiting for. And I am thrilled. I could not be happier. Thank you, thank you, thank you for following up on a promise that I've been hearing from so many politicians my entire life. It sounds like, yeah, when you get shit done, you really get shit done. So you go, girl. Excellent. Thank you so much. Et merci beaucoup. Uh, si, bon, thank you so much. It's such, a, such a beautiful thing. We have the money. We're not just talking about it. We have the money there. And finally, it will be uh, in gender equality. Uh, we need to make sure that we have equitable, equitable recovery from COVID-19, from the pandemic. And of course, funding for these projects always goes a long way, but ultimately, it's also psychological. We need to know as women and girls that we encourage not just to be in the system, but to take up positions of leadership. And that is something that I, I could not be behind anymore. I am absolutely thrilled. So again, congratulations to all the organizations that are receiving the funding. Thank you very much to the Canadian government. Bravo. Congratulations. Very inspiring. Today as well. And of course, we are really looking forward to hearing from you again in conversation with our keynote speaker. And in the moment, oh, uh, now we have other p uh, people will still have our keynote speaker she's coming welcome yes she will be speaking to the exciting headlines that we just announced our keynote speaker today is roseanne archival and of course she was elected the first female national chief for the assembly of first nations uh, chief archival Hey, she has 31 years of experiences in First Nations politics. 31 years. And it's in chef de trois engineers. A third generator, uh, generation chief. The leadership was uh, groundbreaking, historical for women and for the youth. And she was the first woman and youngest chief elected for Tequa Tagamu Nation in 1990 at 23 years of age. Um, she was also the first woman and the youngest deputy grand chief 
for Nishwabi Anishkan Nation, as well as the first female and youngest Grand Chief for Mushke Gogwa Council. And in 2018, she even became the first woman Ontario Regional Chief leading the Chiefs of Ontario. See, quelque chose qui pas plus près. Rosanne est titulaire d'un bar. She holds a baccalaureate in arts. She was the first in her community to have a master's degree in uh, science. Uh, a human science, and she received the Prodestus at 125th anniversary of Confirmation of Canada Medal for her significant contribution to Canada. Chief, Roseanne made positive changes during her term, including a strong and effective pandemic response that really focused on saving lives and, of course, of preserving the health and well-being of First Nation citizens not to mention the establishment of a council of elected women chiefs. Hey, c'est quelque chose. Alors, c'est mon honneur. That's it is quite something. So that's my... ...and pleasure to welcome National Chief Roseanne Archibald. Uh, thank you very much, Miigwech, uh, Juliet, for that uh, great introduction. What you am say, Eskwewek. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much um, for, uh, I, I want to acknowledge, uh, of course, the prayer by Elder Claudette Commanda uh, and Nikki Fraser for the uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, you, Juliet Powell, for moderating, and of course, I want to give extra thanks and gratitude to Minister Miriam Monseth, uh, the Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Rural Economic Development, for hosting this important event. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge the Creator, the world around us, and our place within it. I'm coming to you from my own home territory of Takutagamo Nation, and I acknowledge all of you on the traditional lands and territories where you are all uh, gathered today. Uh, this is a significant time for us as Indigenous people and for our allies who are supporting us. Canadians and the world now know about the innocent children dying and being buried in unmarked graves across Canada, with more to come. As the newly elected national chief, I am working with urgency on the issue of unmarked burial sites across this country. I have spoken to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Attorney General David Lametti regarding additional resources and funding to help us look for our little ones who have suffered enough and to help bring them home. We have all lived through a global pandemic, and though we aren't quite through it all, uh, First Nations continue to do tremendous work in keeping our community safe. They have experienced disparities long before the crisis, and many of the challenges have been exacerbated during the pandemic. Uh, COVID has amplified the systemic and disproportionate impacts in the lives of Indigenous women and girls particularly. And looking forward uh, to the future, there needs to be greater investments in First Nations women, particularly increasing their po uh, political participation and economic empowerment. And I thank you, Minister Monsef, for your announcement today to further support recovery efforts led by women, including addressing systemic issues, encouraging women and girls in leadership, improving economic security and prosperity, and working to end gender-based violence. When we invest in and educate women and girls, they find the strength to voice their opinions and become involved in the political and economic affairs of their communities. Herstory, I like to say herstory versus history, uh, history shows that women's involvement in politics and the economy enhance democratic processes and bring about desperately needed political change. The empowerment of women and girls is key to the success of any nation. We need to work together to invest in the health and well-being of Indigenous women and girls. I believe this will strengthen the country as a whole. As the, at the Assembly of First Nations, there are now three women regional chiefs. And now with me as national chief, we have the highest number of women on the executive in the history of this organization. On Monday, 
I personally witnessed the historic installation of Mary Simon as our first Indigenous woman governor general. I look forward to working with her on First Nation priorities, healing and reconciliation. Young women need strong role models and to see themselves reflected in political institutions so that they know there is a place for them as a First Nation leader, as a mayor, as a federal minister, and even as prime minister. The reality is we need to give hope to our girls that they can have big dreams and realize them. We need to launch them into a brighter future knowing that they can change their lives. They can change their community and they can change the world. There is great hope and light as we move to rebuild, restructure and heal. I look forward to working with all Canadians on building a stronger country where Indigenous women are loved, respected and treated with dignity. Thank you for inviting me. I also wanted to acknowledge that two of the chiefs that are on this call were my nominators nationally, Chief Emily Wheatung and Chief Marilyn Sinclair. So you've got a great group of women here. Uh, wishing you peace beyond all understanding. Nenanaskamon gesakitin. Nenanaskamon in my language means I am thankful, I am grateful, I thank you, and gesakitin means I love you. Well, Kasakitin to you too. Thank you so much, National Chief Archibald. Oh, always, always, always inspiring. And thank you so much for joining us today. I want to underscore another congratulations on your election as the National Chief. And honestly, sharing your insights and experience with us today is invaluable. It's priceless. You've been there, you've done that, and you continue to inspire. So thank you so much. Now we will continue. With uh, my co-moderator, we will welcome the uh, Honorable Miriam Monsef. She will uh, uh, chat with uh, Chief Archibald. A little bit more about Minister Monsef earlier, thanks to Julia Anders' interview and presentation. But since we're highlighting first by inspiring women here, let me say, for those of you who weren't aware, and even if you were aware, it's definitely worth applauding. It's pretty amazing. Minister Monsef is the very first woman to be elected in the federal riding of Peterborough Kawartha, the first Afghan Canadian member of parliament in Canada's history, and the very first, but not the last, Muslim to serve as a federal cabinet minister. Minister Monsef Mipati, welcome. I'm impressed. See, Juliet and your your energy is just filling me up with all sorts of good things merci beaucoup um chief archibald thank you mm. so much chimigwech tashakor for having the courage to pursue this path and for making time for this conversation i know you're new to your role but you're not new to the work i'm i'm speaking on behalf of many who are cheering you on and wondering what are you most excited about as this whirlwind of a new chapter begins for you? Sorry, I didn't, after all these the 18 months, you think I would learn to unmute myself. Um, but thank you for that question. Um, I, you know, I'm honored to have been elected as, um, as the first woman national chief, and I'm really looking forward to continuing to advance uh, the issues of First Nations um, at the national level. As you said, um, I'm definitely uh, new to the role, but the work has been a lifelong journey for me. But right now I'm, I'm focused on community visits and connecting with chiefs. Uh, and councils and their citizens. Uh, for me, building relationships and connections are very important. And I, the conversations I'm having when I travel, I'm carrying these things in my heart as I move forward in my work. To me, um, this is a time when we can make a quantum leap in healing, not only for First Nations, but for the whole country. And I'm most excited to be a part of this fundamental and transformative change that's happening across the country. Uh, it will really strengthen First Nations, particularly 
the recognition and implementation of First Nations sovereignty, jurisdiction, and their inherent in treaty rights. And to me, that's a very important part of the healing journey. That quantum leap uh, that you spoke about, National Chief, uh, we're, we're ready uh, to take that big leap with you. And I'm very much looking forward to strengthening the relationships that exist uh, and hearing the stories that, that you glean from these conversations. Um, so to your point earlier about young women particularly need to see themselves represented and need to know that there is a place for them in the corridors of power. Yeah, I, I look at your career, you've been the first in many, many different roles in 1990. You were 23. You were the first woman and the youngest chief ever elected for Tigwatagma. You were the first woman and the youngest deputy grand chief for Nishnabe Aski Nation. You were the first woman to be elected as an Ontario regional chief in 2018. And for the first time, there were three women representing uh, as regional chiefs. Uh, uh, and that was a pretty cool experience working with the three of you. And here you are breaking another barrier as the first woman to be elected national chief of the Assembly of First Nations. How, how, how on earth did you work up the courage at 23 to put your name on a ballot? And what are some of the challenges and some advice you may have for others watching, thinking, dreaming? Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, at 23, I, I'm a third generation chief. So, um, you know, politics and leadership is the family business. You often see families who are all doctors or lawyers. Um, and in our family, we're, we're a leadership family. And so uh, putting my name forward uh, at a young age, it felt, I was called to do that work. I actually had to get nominated. And so I was nominated. And at the time um, I just felt, you know, I'm gonna answer this call. But to the second part of your question, up until recently, I've always been the only woman, the only woman in a room full of men. And that's actually been my life journey. And even with the recent installation of the, uh, the Governor General, Mary Simon, there was a picture that was shown somewhere on the media. And you'll see me in this sea of men, uh, you know, surrounded and for me, we really need to normalize seeing women everywhere in proportionate numbers, in boardrooms, in the halls of power, as you said. And we have to start working toward 50-50 because that's the, the population is made up of 50% of women and for 50% of men approximately. And so we have to get to those numbers in every political situation. Um, we need the, you know, our corporate boards to be 50% women. And so I still find myself even now uh, surrounded by men and that, that really has to change. Um, and, and it is about answering the call for women, for women to answer those calls when they are asked to run for a position. But I also went into the AFS, AFN office on Monday after the ceremony and I stood in front of all the pictures of the National Chiefs to date and soon my picture is going to be there and I realized that another part of my life journey is to be a disruptor. Um, a disruptor will change the landscape and the trajectory of the space they inhabit and my space is First Nation politics. However, anyone can be a disruptor in any forum, in any space. And this is my encouragement to, to young women out there listening. Find your inner strength, find your inner courage and walk forward knowing that all the women that have come before you are standing behind you, supporting you 
uh, encouraging you. And also keep in mind that all of the women and girls of the future will be inspired by you. They will be impacted by your decision to change her story. So disruption is a big part of my journey. And I believe that we disrupt processes that no longer work like patriarchy, colonialism, these systems need to be disrupted. So I encourage young women to do that. Uh, yes, you've certainly changed the landscape and you got things done, lady. Um, I'm sure all of us have had days as elected representatives where when we have thought, what the what was I thinking? The hard days when, you know, the the system work is incredibly difficult. Um, I'm curious, National Chief, what do you do on those days? And what did you do in, in the earlier days of your careers as a 20-something-year-old in, in this male-dominated sector? How did you get out of bed on those days? How did you put on the face of a leader and go out there and keep keep doing the work? Can you talk to us a little bit about some of those skills and some of those tips? Yeah, well, you, I think you addressed it um, in, a, in a way when you said the difficulties of being in leadership. There is lateral violence against women in leadership. And I've had to face that many times in my career. And I, I always think about the saying that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> and like many women, I have always been strengthened. I've been made stronger by these challenges. Um, in fact, all of the things that are negative about the work have really made me more relentless. Uh, it's only added to my resiliency. And how I've moved through the space is always by leaning on my spiritual practices of smudging, praying, meditating, ceremony, in order to keep me grounded. I've also had to take extra care of my mental health on the journey. I've, you know, I've done group therapy, counseling, art therapy, and I would hope that, um, that women are encouraged to do self-care in this way, spiritual self-care, emotional self-care, um, you know, all the ways that we can keep our strength for this journey. And so when I was running for national chief, I talked about having a strength-based and heart-centered approach to leadership. And that's really the basis of my work. And that spiritual, the spiritual and emotional lessons that I've learned, particularly about self-care, are what have carried me and allowed me to go into these larger, more stressful roles, because you have to really take care of yourself. And it's like that saying, we've heard this analogy many times, when you're on a plane, you put on your own mask first, then you help somebody else. If you don't have your mask on, you're not going to be able to help anybody. So it's about self-care, I would say, is an important part of a message I would give to other women leaders who want to keep moving forward in this kind of work. Well, National Chief, on behalf of the Prime Minister, on behalf of the Government of Canada, let me once again congratulate you and thank you for your courage. We all look forward to working with you and learning from you. And I, my team and I are fangirling huge and grateful to the smart women who supported you uh, to get to where you are and the good men and folks in between. Uh, Juliet, thank you for allowing me to channel my inner Oprah and spend some time with our wonderful national chief. Back to you. Well, thank you both. I mean, that was an incredible conversation. National Chief Archibald, Minister Monsef, Merci à vous deux. Uh, personally, I can definitely relate to what you were talking about uh, when you talked about being a disruptor in just about every room that you're in, be that a face-to-face -face situation or a Zoom room. Invariably, when you are a woman and you are surrounded mostly by men, that's how you end up feeling. And you have both shown us the way 
um, how to do that constructively and positively, not just for ourselves, but also for future generations. And for that, I am very, very grateful. I will do my best to uphold my part as well. I also want to thank again, Elder Commanda for being with us today and our sincere appreciation to you and for all of you who have joined us via live stream, you know, we really hope that the perspectives that were shared here today and the experiences of all the women is something that inspires you, something that you can relate to and something that you feel that you'll be able to build on. And I think, you know, part of the main message is that we all share a passion for diversity, for equality and for female leadership. On peut tout faire une différence. We can all make a difference, each of us, uh, each of us, all the different experiences, all the lives together, this makes a difference and all together, this uh, difference is even greater, whether you're in a leadership position at work, at home, at school, uh, from your living room, uh, each of us can uh, be a leader and a source of inspiration for those around us every day. The Equal Futures Network on social media for more inspiring stories. And we all need these stories now more than ever. And we all turn to social media more and more to get these stories. So when you're in there kind of, you know, being distracted by a million different things, if you need some healing, that might be the first place you want to go, the Equal Futures Network with other like-minded Canadians. And for all of our leaders that joined us today, thank you again for taking the time. I know that you're all busy and some had to jump off already, but while you're all signing off um, and you know breaking into your small discussion groups, just a reminder on how to join those discussions and how they're posted in your chat. So that you always have this and the transcript to remind you of this very, very special Zoom event. And of course, it's all gonna be sent to your inbox as well for those of you who have to jump off very, very quickly. Encore une fois, merci beaucoup à tout le monde qui a participé aujourd'hui. Once again, thank you so much for all of you. Leaders who are not afraid to be the first, thank you for being here today. Merci à tout le monde. Au revoir, have a great day. Thank summer. you, goodbye.